Welcome to Pride, Polygamy, and Parables. This is going to be an overview of the entire book of Jacob, whereas originally I had only intended to do an overview of the olive tree allegory or parable, as I call it. And part of that is because allegories indicate that there's only one way of interpreting something that Jesus taught in parables. And I very much see this as a parable. Um, and the interesting thing is, I'm really glad I had extra time to study this week because the more I studied, the more I received and the more complex and intricate this became. And I received answers to questions I've had about this allegory for years. I wondered why is this talking so much about the roots? What 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 are the roots in this thing? And what what are the numbers all about? Why does it keep talking about numbers in this? Uh, and I've received that. And yet, because I do believe this is a parable, please understand my interpretation here, even though it may be vastly different from what you have encountered as far as interpretations of this go in the past, that does not in any way invalidate things you have received or been taught. It's simply another layer of interpretation. And because this is going to be somewhat touchy, I would say, of a, of a subject and also really different from what you may have encountered before, I would just pray that you would keep an open mind, consider what here applies to you, what doesn't, um, take it to prayer and and go from there with this. All right. So with that said, there is a lot to get into here. So let's just get into this. So there are these antithetical themes throughout the book of Jacob. And it's very much structured in such a way that I could tell it was intentional. And he's obviously taking some of his cues from Isaiah, right, with these antithetical themes. So the first set I have here for you is true love versus whoredoms or polygyny, meaning polygamy in the sense of one man with many wives and concubinism. Then you have the temple and ascension versus false or limiting doctrines. You have elitism versus Zion, secret combinations versus godly covenants, the tree of life versus death and destruction, and ultimately Christ versus Satan. And these themes are all found in the olive tree parable. So let's just dig right into it. We're going to just skip over the first couple of verses for brevity's sake. This is just kind of an intro and start with verses three through six, where it says, for behold, thus saith the Lord, I will liken thee, O house of Israel, like unto a tame olive tree, which a man took and nourished in his vineyard, and it grew and waxed old and began to decay. And it came to pass that the master of the vineyard went forth, and he saw that his olive tree began to decay. And he said, I will prune it and dig about it and nourish it, that perhaps it may shoot forth young and tender branches, and it perish not. And it came to pass that he pruned it and digged about it and nourished it according to his word. And it came to pass that after many days, it began to put forth somewhat a little young and tender branches. But behold, the main top thereof began to perish. What is going on here? Well, before we delve into what Jacob has to say more, I want to remind you that a tree is highly symbolic, right? Throughout the scriptures, we start off the Book of Mormon with a tree of life. And trees are also kind of synonymous, or the tree of life is kind of synonymous with temples and temples are synonymous with mountains or the mountain of the Lord. And in each of these, there tends to be a three-part structure. Now, some of what I'm going to be sharing with you in this lesson was actually taken from some presentations and a book that's coming out soon by Dave Butler. It's called In the Language of Adam. You may, those of you who uh, listen to the Latter-day Disciples podcast or listening to this on Latter-day Disciples right now might be getting a review <laughs> of a conversation that Megan had this week with Dave. But the point is there's this three-part structure, either from the roots of the mountain all the way up to the top or from the celestial to terrestrial to celestial in the temple. And, and the same thing could be said for the idea of a tree or 
what's known as a world tree in many traditions. So just keep that in mind as we go forward, that that may be one way of interpreting this where the branches could represent something up in heaven. The trunk is that in-between place or way station between heaven and earth. And then the roots could represent the earth. And I believe Jacob is alluding to this because there is a lot of temple language and imagery throughout his record. So first off, chapter one, verse two, he says that Nephi gives him a commandment that he should write upon these plates a few of the things which he considers to be most precious. Where have we heard that terminology? In first Nephi 11 and nine, where Nephi is having his vision of the tree of life, which is most precious, he says. And then again, in chapter 117 of Jacob, he says that he gave his people this sermon that was taught to them in the temple. He even mentions garments in verse 19, which is kind of interesting. And then in chapter 2, verse 11, Jacob says, get thou up into the temple, meaning this is God speaking these words to him, get to the temple on the morrow, and God's going to declare or give him the words to speak. And then also in chapter 221, he's speaking to the people saying, do you not suppose that such things are abominable, meaning the hoarding of wealth? So he starts off the sermon with that, right? That this is abominable to him who created all flesh. And the one being is as precious in his sight as the other, because ultimately we are the temple or the body of Christ. And then there's this idea or theme of revelation, right? Living waters, chapter one, verse six. I mean, I could give you so many examples of this, but I'm just going to give you two for time's sake here. In one six, and we also had many revelations and the spirit of much prophecy, wherefore we knew of Christ and his kingdom, which should come. Uh, this is where he goes on to say, we could speak and mountains would move and the trees and the waves would obey us, right? Because of this. Uh, chapter four, verse eight also alludes to this. Behold, great and marvelous are the works of the Lord. How unsearchable are the depths of the mysteries of him. Of course, mysteries can also allude to temple things, things that are hidden behind a veil that are only revealed uh, to certain people of a certain order who take upon themselves certain covenants. And it is impossible that man should find out all his ways, and no man knoweth of his ways, save it be revealed unto him. Wherefore, brethren, despise not the revelations of God. And this is where he goes on to talk about the Jews missing the mark, you know, and because they're missing Christ and Christ is a part of that, that whole tree of life thing that Nephi saw. Okay. Then we have these themes of decay and death throughout Jacob. So starting with chapter two, verse 23, but the word of God burdens me because of your grosser crime. So now he's going to move on from hoarding wealth to speaking about a grosser crime for behold, thus saith the Lord, this people begin to wax in iniquity, they understand not the scriptures. For they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms because of the things which are written concerning David and Solomon his son. And then at the end of Jacob in 7 and 10, he's speaking to Sherem, the Antichrist. And he says unto him, Believest thou the scriptures? And he said, Yea. And I said unto him, Then you do not understand them. So there's this idea here of people who are a temple going people who have the scriptures, but because they are not reading them by revelation or because they're using them to maybe proof texts, concepts that are very, as it says in chapter seven, flattering unto them, they do not actually understand the scriptures. They may have some knowledge, but they lack wisdom. And going on here with Jacob chapter 2, verse 15, this idea of there being young and tender branches is the same language that he uses in his sermon. He says, and now it came to pass that the people of Nephi under the reign of the second king began to grow hard in their hearts 
we're going to go into that some more, and indulge themselves somewhat in wicked practices, such as like unto David of old, desiring many wives and concubines, and also Solomon his son. Verse 33 says, for they shall not lead away captive the daughters of my people because of their what? Their tenderness. So here you have hard hearts versus tenderness, or I would say soft or broken hearts. And notice that language there, they're leading them away captive. This would indicate some sort of bondage or slavery. And of course, concubinism technically is sexual slavery. We call it by different names in our society today, but it is it is sexual slavery. And then uh, two and seven says, and also it grieveth me that I must use so much boldness of speech concerning you before your wives and your children. Children are the young ones, right? Many of whose feelings are exceedingly tender and chaste and delicate before God, which thing is pleasing unto God. So really what Jacob is getting at here throughout all of this is, is true love, the love of Christ, like godly love. And this idea is brought out with the imagery of hearts. So for instance, it says that Sherem led away many hearts. And of course, his goal was to overthrow the doctrine of Christ, which ultimately leads to the tree of life, right? Nephi talked about that. It, you enter in through the gate and then you keep going until you get to the love of God, which is what the tree of life, as Nephi said, is. It is the love of God, right? And Satan is the one who is the author. And I would say finisher of this faith that Sherem is preaching of, well, just follow the law of Moses and we can't know anything beyond that, right? But when Sherem does receive a testimony of Christ and the Holy Ghost and angels, he falls down like he's dead, right? Which happens a lot in the Book of Mormon. But this is the kind of the first instance of that. And it says that he's nourished for the space of many days. Nourished. We're going to hear so much of that in the olive tree allegory. And then the interesting thing is after that, when he confesses, the people fall down. They essentially die and are born again in Christ. And it says that the love of God was restored again among the people. So what were they lacking? What was this doctrine, not only of polygamy, but of wealth hoarding, what did that lack? It lacks love. It is the antithesis to the love of God. And it says that after that, they began to search the scriptures again. In other words, they were seeking true revelation. So going on with the olive tree parable now in 7 through 14, and it came to pass that the master of the vineyard saw it, and he said unto his servant, it grieveth me that I should lose this tree, wherefore go and pluck the branches from a wild olive tree and bring them hither unto me, and we will pluck off those main branches which are beginning to wither away, and we will cast them in the fire that they may be burned. And behold, saith the Lord of the vineyard, I take away many of these young and tender branches, and I will graft them whithersoever I will, and it mattereth not that if it so be that the root of this tree will perish, I may preserve the fruit thereof unto myself. Wherefore, I will take these young and tender branches and I will graft them whithersoever I will. Take thou the branches of the wild olive tree and graft them in, in the stead thereof. And these which I have plucked off, I will cast into the fire and burn them that they may not cumber the ground of my vineyard. So this is one of only two instances where there's an actual, I would say, plucking and burning or pruning and burning going on. But I want to go into this idea of, of grafting, because if you understand how grafting works, right, you cut off a branch, you take it to another tree, you make a cut in the other tree and you insert the branch. Well, if you recall what we've discussed previously about cutting in Hebrew, that indicates covenants. So he's cutting covenants here with people in various ways. 
let's continue on with this. So, and it came to pass that the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did according to the word of the Lord of the vineyard and grafted in the branches of the wild olive tree and the Lord of the vineyard caused that it should be digged about and pruned and nourished. There's that word saying unto his servant, it grieveth me that I should lose this tree. Wherefore, that perhaps I might preserve the roots thereof, that they perish not, that I might preserve them unto myself, I have done this thing. Wherefore, go thy way, watch the tree, and nourish it according to my words, and these will I place in the nethermost parts of my vineyard, whithersoever I will, and it mattereth not unto thee that I do it, that I may preserve unto myself the natural branches of the tree, and also that I may lay, lay up the fruit thereof against the season unto myself, where it grieveth me that I should lose this tree and the fruit thereof. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard went his way and hid the natural branches of the tame olive tree in the nethermost parts of the vineyard, some in one and some in another, according to his will and pleasure. We're going to get into this idea of nethermost in a bit here. But first off, I want to explore a bit more what is going on with this society at the time to where Jacob is, is making this comparison with this parable. So in Jacob chapters two and three, he says, behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. And wherefore thus saith the Lord, I've led this people forth out of the land of Jerusalem. So obviously there's a parallel here, right? They're being led out. These branches are being led out. There's covenants being cut by the power of mine arm that I might raise up unto me a righteous branch from the fruit of the loins of Joseph. And Joseph was a fruitful bough that goes over the wall, all of that, right? Wherefore I, the Lord God, will not suffer that this people shall do like unto them of old. And then in three, it says, and the time speedily cometh that except ye repent, they, meaning the Lamanites, shall possess the land of your inheritance. And the Lord God will lead away the righteous out from among you. Huh. Is that going to happen later on in this parable? For they have not forgotten the commandment of the Lord, which was given unto our father. Or interestingly, uh, Gwendolyn Wynn or Wine um, has a YouTube channel that speaks to polygamy and things like that. And she has a really interesting document that shows this could actually say our fathers, that they should have saved it were one wife and concubines, they should have none. And I think there's something to that, because if you go to Deuteronomy 17, it it almost seems like Jacob was taking his sermon from here because it starts off with the temple and sacrifices. And then it goes on to speak to idolatry and the idea of election and duties for kings saying that you are about to enter the land the Lord your God is giving you. So, the, so a promised land. And we've spoken before about the idea of us all being kings and queens here or needing to live up to that and be give, being given that freedom and those blessings to do so. And in Deuteronomy 17, it says, the kings must not build up a large stable of horses for himself or send his people to Egypt to buy horses for the Lord has told you. You must never return to Egypt, right? Don't go back. Don't go back to the old ways and the stuff you left. The king must not take many wives for himself and he must not accumulate large amounts of wealth in silver and gold for himself. Isn't that interesting? Then it goes on to talk about scriptures. He must always keep that copy with him, meaning the law, and read it daily as long as he lives. So he'll learn to fear the Lord, his God. And this reading of the scriptures <laughs> by the spirit, hopefully, right, will prevent him from becoming proud and acting as if he is above his fellow citizens and prevent him from turning away from these commands in the smallest way and will ensure that he and his descendants will reign for many generations. What is the promise that both Nephi and Moses give? Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God shall give thee. Because if you don't, there are covenant curses that come with it, and it leads speedily to destruction. Interestingly enough, it seems like the people of Israel lost this law soon after the time of Joshua. And it wasn't discovered again until the time of Josiah, which was hundreds and hundreds of years later. So 
polygamy and concubinism was rampant throughout their culture. Um, we'll discuss that some more in a minute here, but they didn't seem to really know until the time of Josiah. And yet, even after they received the law, uh, Jacob makes it really clear that they were still doing that. And so what happens? A branch is let out and uh, some of the tree is pruned and burned because of what they're doing. And of course, this goes hand in hand with discussions that we have had about the mother and, and the divine feminine. Because as it says in Ezekiel 19, which is written about 592 BC, this was a contemporary of, of Lehi, thy mother is like a vine in thy blood planted by the waters. She was fruitful and full of branches by reason of many waters. And she had strong rods for the scepters of them that bear rule, rods, branches, right? And her stature was exalted among the thick branches. And she appeared in her height with the multitude of her branches, but she was plucked up in fury. She was cast down to the ground. The east wind dried up her fruit. Her strong rods were broken and withered. The fire consumed them. And now she is planted in the wilderness in a dry and thirsty ground. What is this referring to? Well, this is talking about the time during Josiah's reign at, when they literally removed the menorah and or the Asherah from the Holy of Holies in the temple. And yes, I've mentioned this before. It was more likely to have been in the Holy of Holies. So this was removed. And then right after this comes swift destruction. So there is an imbalance going on here of male and female and the females being cast out. Okay. The mother's being removed. Now I want to give you another interpretation that might help with your understanding of this allegory. In many ancient traditions, you can see this in many Native American traditions and, and throughout the world, really, the father is represented up above because the father represents kind of the spiritual realm. And the mother, this should be really obvious to us, Mother Earth, right? This is a very ancient understanding that the mother is in the earth. And so one way of interpreting this allegory could be that the branches or the top of the tree represents the masculine, the male part of the doctrine as well as since we are told this tree literally also represents Israel, it could represent the male component of Israel. And the roots could represent the women as well as Heavenly Mother. So something to consider there as we go on. Interestingly, Isaiah 5 also speaks to this idea of a vineyard. It has such similar imagery in it that I don't think we can ignore it. And it says that I have my, I'm going to sing a love song for my beloved. So this is about love. There's a vineyard, right, on a hill up high. It has a watchtower. Um, it, he expected it to yield grapes, but it produces wild grapes. So God's going to have its hedge removed. It's going to be burned. The wall's going to be broken through and trampled. I'm going to make it a desolation. And into Sheol will descend their elite, right? Because what we're talking about here are, are doctrines of elitism, right? Well, I'm special. Um, so I'm accumulating wealth because God is blessing me. Therefore, I am special. And that person isn't accumulating wealth. So they must be doing something wrong. They must not be as righteous as we are who have all this wealth. And so we are part of this elite class. And this then goes on to naturally lead in these societies to polygamy and concubinism. Why? Because the more wealth men in the East had, the more wives they could afford. And so you had this elite class with a lot of money and a lot of women. And of course, women would seek out men 
you know, who had more money if they were in a state that was financially, physically precarious, right? It would be more likely they're going to seek them out than a man who can't afford a family and a wife and things like that. So you start having a separation of classes here. And because of this, especially in Jacob's time where you're having people who are having like incredible ascendant experiences and gifts who should be Zion, you're not having Zion. Now you are having classism. All right. So going on though, here with Isaiah five, it says, moreover, I will forbid the rain clouds to rain on it. Therefore are my people exiled without knowing why. And they don't even know why they think they're doing things right. Mankind is brought low when men debase themselves in this way, says the Lord of hosts. Interestingly, just in Jacob 2, he uses this phrase, Lord of hosts, meaning the Lord of heaven's armies, the ones who will exact vengeance, six times. Is an allusion to Isaiah? Is he doing this on purpose? Let's continue on. So also in Isaiah 5, and this is something that Dave Butler brings out, it says, woe to those who drag their sins behind them with ropes made of lies, who drag wickedness behind them like a cart. They even mock God and say, hurry up and do something. We want to see what you can do. Let the Holy One of Israel carry out his plan, or we want to know what it is. And he talks about how some of the language here can be reinterpreted so that really what this could be alluding to is, again, Josiah and others like Hezekiah removing the menorah from the temple and the Asherah really ultimately is what they're removing. They're removing the feminine with ropes. They're dragging it out into the wilderness, like it said in Ezekiel, right? They're, they're abusing it. And he talks about how some of the language here can be actually sexual. Uh, so for instance, we want to know it. So know that word, we've discussed this, you know, ad nauseum at this point, how that can be sexual in nature. So he's making the claim that Isaiah is comparing this defilement of the temple and the menorah to rape of a woman. And then he goes on to say, woe to those who say that evil is good and good is evil, right? Oh, well, we're purifying things. We are going back to the fundamentals here. We're cleaning up our religion, right? We're going through, we're editing the documents, we're editing the doctrine. He's saying they're calling evil good, good evil, and that light is dark and dark is light, which would make sense in terms of the men menorah because the menorah is what was lit. So when you exterminate that light, you're saying, well, this is good, this is light, but really you're in darkness. Bitter, sweet, sweet is bitter. What does the tree of life have? Sweet fruit. And you're saying that it's bitter, but you're replacing the sweetness with true bitterness. What sorrow for those who are wise, who is wisdom? What does wisdom refer to? The mother, the divine feminine, in their own eyes. And in 2 Kings 23, it, it talks about this, right? He takes the Asherah pole from the temple of the Lord. It's speaking of Josiah. It says Hezekiah did something similar, but I wonder if that's one of those situations in the Bible where they kind of repeat the same story and you're like, didn't that just happen? And did it really happen again? I, I don't know. But he ground it to patter and scattered the dust over the graves of the common people, interestingly enough, because uh, there's still elitism going on here. Now, we've mentioned before how nobody seems to hate women more than Satan. <laughs> and we've also discussed a lot of mythology and how there are certain patterns that have held true literally since the beginning of time that go hand in hand with temple doctrine and the doctrine of Christ and ascension. And in one of these myths, it's a Mesopotamian battle that takes place between the Anzu bird, which would be representative of the adversary or Satan or Lucifer, and the god Ninurta. So Anzu steals the, the tablets of destiny, which would be kind of like Moses' stone tablets or the law or the records. He steals it from the god Enlil in the battle that took place in the divine council. And the rebel god screams at the god Ninurta, I have taken away every single right, R-I-T-E, meaning, right, like religious rights. By the way, this is taken from the 
ancient tradition podcast. I'm quoting it here at this point. And I am in charge of all the gods' orders. Who are you to come and do battle against me? Give your reasons. Instantly, his speech rushed out at him. The warrior Ninurta answered Anzu, I am the avenger, which is interestingly because that's how you can also interpret the term judge in the Old Testament or the judges. So I am the avenger of Duranki's God. Duranki means where heaven and earth come together. So we're talking about a temple here. So essentially what this is saying is Satan changed the temple rites. How, how would he even do that? Well, <laughs> I mean, Nephi makes it very clear that Satan transforms himself sometimes nigh unto an angel of light. So some people can receive false revelation and think, well, this is light when really it's darkness. And they can think, well, this is sweet when really it's bitterness. And apparently there was some of this going on in Jacob's time and in Lehi's time, possibly even, you know, during the times of Josiah and Hezekiah. We'll get into this some more, but let's continue on with the parable as our structure. So Jacob 5, 15 through 18. And it came to pass that a long time passed away. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, come, let us go down into the vineyard that we may labor in the vineyard. So do you see how they're coming down here? They're coming down into the vineyard. And then there's this tree, which you could say is the tree of, of life. And then they take these branches and they put them into the nethermost parts of the vineyard. I probably didn't explain that well enough beforehand, but that goes hand in hand with this, especially very ancient temple imagery where you have this tree like in Eden, it's up on a mount, it's in a, like a, I guess you could say in, in one sense, it's in a terrestrial sphere and it, there are these four rivers that flow out to the four ends of the earth. And as we'll see, there are four branches that the Lord plants in the nethermost parts. Nethermost literally means like lowest. So they're going from highest to middle to lowest here. So this is part of this temple theology. And so going on now, it came to pass that the servant said, and his master, behold, look here, behold the tree. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard looked and beheld the tree in which the wild olive branches had been grafted and it had sprung forth and begun to bear fruit. And he beheld that it was good. And the fruit thereof was like unto the natural fruit. And he said unto the servant, behold, the branches of the wild tree have taken hold of the moisture of the root thereof. So what is he bringing back in that wasn't there before. Remember that at the beginning of this parable, this tree is dying. It is dead. It is not receiving nourishment from the roots. And you could equate that with revelation. It's not receiving the waters of life and spirit and whatever it is. Um, but also you could say that it is neglecting the feminine. And because it's it's just getting so top heavy, it's it's dying, which you actually see this. I, I've even seen this in some ways, you could say, among members of the church, where so much of their focus is on the spiritual and serving in church and, you know, my calling and reading the scriptures. They actually neglect the physical, like to the point where they're bodies are just breaking down or they're eating so unhealthily. And, you know, and I, I know from personal experience, because I have dealt with so much physical injury and illness and disability, it can very much inhibit your ability to connect spiritually. It, it leaves you wide open, wide open to the whisperings and buffetings of the adversary. Now, I'm not saying here, by the way, that if somebody has a physical disability or physical issues, that they're going to be less spiritual than another person. Okay. Every single person in my family is dealing with physical limitations. Um, but what I'm saying is it, how we approach things needs to be balanced. If we are neglecting the physical, the mother, 
to loving our bodies, loving the earth, loving nature and all of that for the sake of the spiritual, you become very, very imbalanced and the zealousness can go very, very awry. Uh, look at what we have in our own scriptures. We have a word of wisdom. And what is that word of wisdom all about? It is about nourishing the physical in balance, in harmony with nature and the seasons, right? And and health and and everything like that, the animals. So it's really important to have this, this balance. You need those roots. And so going on here, um, the root thereof hath brought forth much strength. And because of the much strength of the root thereof, the wild branches have brought forth tame fruit. Now, if we had not grafted in these branches, the tree thereof would have perished. Why is that? Think about that. Why? And now behold, I shall lay up much fruit, which the tree thereof hath brought forth. And the fruit thereof I shall lay up against the season unto mine own self. Okay, now if you'll notice here, what's happening is these wild branches are all pretty much universally helping to bring forth good fruit. Verses 20 through 21, you have a branch planted in a poor spot. It brings forth much good fruit. Verse 23, a branch, the second one planted in the poorest spot brings forth much good fruit. Then you have what is said to be another branch, and it says it brings forth fruit. That's verse 24. And then the fourth one is, it says the last, and it is planted in a good spot of the ground, and it brings forth part tame and part wild fruit. So this, this works, right? And Ask yourself this question, would the Lord bring in doctrines or that are false into his body? Would he bring in things that are naturally prone to producing bad or wild fruit? He wouldn't, right? What the Lord of the vineyard, i.e. Christ, is doing here is he's bringing in things that are good. He's only going to bring in that which is good. And I had to ask myself, well, what, what, why is it called wild then? And I discovered, as is often the case with Hebrew, that there are multiple interpretations for this word. Now, the word generally for wild in the Old Testament is sade. Um, in Strong's Dictionary, it can be interpreted as a field, meaning, yes, that wilderness, that field that Lehi sees in his vision, you know, that represents that. But it can also refer to like a specific territory of royalty or private property. Also, this is the same root as for the word Shaddai, which means God with breasts, which can be interpreted as mother, the mother God or a heavenly mother. And so what I am suggesting here is that sometimes the word for wild is in this context that he is bringing in something really good and that what might be being restored here is the doctrine of the mother and the divine feminine and that women are being restored here to their rightful place within the context of the gospel and their role in the kingdom. And this is what Christ does. When Christ was on the earth, one of the things that he did was to elevate women in a society where they were not even allowed to testify in court. He had women who were supporting his work. Many scholars believe now that the 70s that were sent out were actually couple missionaries. And I think there's a lot of evidence for that. So this is what Christ does. How many times does he put himself in feminine roles or refer to himself in feminine ways. And just like it says in verse 28, it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard and the servant of the Lord of the vineyard did nourish all the fruit of the vineyard. Well, this brings to mind the idea of the woman in Revelation who flees where? Into the wilderness with her child. When Satan is coming after her, she goes out in the wilderness and is nourished for a time, times and half a time. There's a lot of connection here to feminine imagery. And I don't believe it's accidental. 
the other thing that is interesting about this woman in Revelation 12 is that she is given two wings of a great eagle to fly from the presence of the serpent. So that would indicate some form of ascension. Interestingly enough, I don't want to like get into this, but in the revelation in Daniel, where he sees these animals, it starts off with a lion, which could represent Judah, right? At, especially at the time of Lehi. And it had wings, but it was stripped of its wings. And it it says it's taught to like walk like a man. It's, it stands upright. So it's very imbalanced. Like it's a really imbalanced, awkward way for this lion to walk. And then the next animal is a bear. And the bear has three, count them, three ribs. What do ribs represent in the Bible? At the very beginning in Genesis, Eve. But this bear has three of them. So guess what happens to that bear? It's put on its side and it walks on like its side, which is a really awkward, imbalanced way for a bear to be. And bears, of course, have tons to do with the feminine. Job mentions Ursa major and minor which is a mother bear and her cubs I mean, there's just like there's just so much here that i could go into but just maybe pray and ponder on that for a bit because i need to go on here so we talked about how the tree of life uh was likely in the holy of holies and the interesting thing is jacob mentions in chapter 4 16 17 about the jews rejecting the foundation stone in the holy of holies there was also something known as the foundation stone. It was supposed to be the place where all of creation started. Literally, the earth and all of creation was built on this foundation stone that was there in the Holy of Holies, which was also known as the well of souls. So a well of water springing up on everlasting life. There was a well there. Um, and, and of course, towards the end of Jacob, he in chapter 7, 21 and 25, he talks about how these Nephites are born again and they trust in the rock of their salvation. I mean, he also talks about how the Lord's arm is extended to you all the day long. Think about the idea of an arm extending through a veil in terms of the temple. See how all of this is just so temple, like it's just dripping, but not just temple, the holy of holies. In the temple. And interestingly, we're told that the Nehushtan or the serpent on the cross was also removed by Hezekiah from the Holy of Holies. And it's meant that Nehushtan is brought up so many times in the Book of Mormon. And in the Bible, it's brought up twice. It's brought up in the story of Moses and the Israelites and is brought up when Hezekiah removes it. And that's it. But they refer to it so much. But I just want to point out that if Satan is removing things, then what Jacob and all this is referring to is bringing it back in, bringing it back to the Holy of Holies, bringing back an ascension. And you cannot have that without the mother, right? What does Nephi see first? He sees the mother and then he sees Jesus Christ as the fruit. You can't have one without the other. They are in a sense interchangeable in a lot of the imagery and language. And they are inextricably intertwined. Okay, going on now. And it came to pass that a long time had passed away. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto his servant, come, let us go down into the vineyard that we may labor again in the vineyard. Going down again, right? For behold, the time draweth near and the end soon cometh. Wherefore, I must lay up fruit against the season. Oh, so we're getting towards the end here now. Okay. Remember that that's going to come up later, but the end soon cometh. So he's got to gather in and the harvest. And so he goes on to say that the Lord and the servant went down, came to the tree whose natural branches had been broken off and the wild branches had been grafted in and behold, all sorts of fruit did cumber the tree. How does that happen? Think about that. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard did taste of the fruit of every sort according to its number. <laughs> and the Lord of the vineyard said, behold, this long time have we nourished this tree. And I have laid up unto myself against the season much fruit. But behold, this time it hath brought forth much fruit and there's none of it, which is, is good. What does that have to do with the number? Right? Why is Jacob talking about polygamy? Because there is an imbalance of male and female, if that's not already abundantly clear to you, it, 
we're going to talk about this some more, but it, it creates a massive imbalance actually between male and female ultimately in the end. So numbers here are really important when it comes to having a balanced tree of life. And behold, there are all kinds of bad fruit and it profiteth me nothing, notwithstanding all our labor and now it grieveth me that I should lose this tree. Okay, so here's something else that Dave Butler points out, that the word corrupt that is used here in this parable, the scripture that apparently was taken from Jerusalem that had been among all these Old Testament records, so likely it was written in Hebrew, right? That the word for corrupt in, in Hebrew um, that Jacob uses in verses 39 through 48 seven times, uh, and then two times again in verse 75, that 12 of the 17 occurrences of this word corrupt in the King James Bible reflect some form of the word shachat in the underlying Hebrew. So this is from page 262 of his book that is coming out next month, by the way, in the language of Adam. So he says that this word shachat, for instance, is used in Genesis 6, 11 through 12, where you have the sons of God that lust after the daughters of men, and they produce these giants that ruin the earth, interestingly enough, if we relate that to this idea of the roots of the tree and the mother. And so it says that they corrupted, the earth was corrupt, had been corrupted, and that they were corrupt. And, and remember, what does Jacob say here? That, that, that God's not going to allow, essentially, these men to corrupt his daughters with this doctrine. And then this word corrupt, or shacha, is used again in Exodus 32, verses 6 through 7 that Moses is up on the mount, uh, but the children of Israel rose up early, offered burnt offerings, uh, and brought peace offerings, and then the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said to Moses, go get thee down for thy people, which thou brought us out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. I believe this is at the time of the golden calf. Interesting that they're using gold and wealth and things here to do this false idolatrous form of worship, but also the idea is that they corrupted themselves. And then you have the word play here, which is sichek. And this actually has sexual connotations as well. So for instance, in Genesis 26 and 8, Abimelech sees Isaac, quote, playing with his wife, Rebecca, and is surprised because this is one of the stories where Rebecca was essentially going to be sold into sexual servitude like Sarah was with Abraham to Pharaoh. So the idea is that both Zenos and Jacob here are relating this idea of corruption of fruit, of doctrine, of the temple, of Israel to sexual corruption of some form. And you see this play out at the end of the olive tree allegory. You know, they had to keep the root and the top equal according to the strength. So they they labor to keep the roots and the tops equal. And they then they become like under one body. And then the fruits are equal. Right? You become one because you can't. We're going to get into this, but you can't with the doctrine of polygamy. That can never happen. And I, I'm going to show you why. So just keep an open mind, like I said. Um, which fruit was most precious unto him from the beginning. So I think this also relates to Again, this idea of, of false doctrines coming in, because in John 15, we've discussed how Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the keeper of the vineyard. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. All right? Jesus is part of this tree of life, this body, whatever. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes to make it even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So they have been pruned because of the true doctrine they're receiving from Christ, the one who elevates women, <clears throat> to replace the false doctrine. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. Just as no branch can bear fruit by itself unless it remains in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Okay, so now we're starting with verse 37 of the allegory. But behold, the wild branches have grown and have overrun the roots thereof. And because that the wild branches have overcome the roots thereof, it hath brought forth much evil fruit. So again, the same thing is happening. The roots are being messed with. The roots aren't 
able to provide the nourishment that they're meant to because they're not, I don't know, listening to the roots, <laughs> paying attention to the roots, nourishing, you know, receiving things from the roots. They're just trying to get it all from up above instead of trying to get it from the roots. Um, so it's brought forth evil fruit. And because of all this evil fruit, he says, the tree's beginning to perish, just like the tree at the beginning of the parable. And it will soon become ripened that it may be cast into the fire, except we should do something. Remember, this is like, hey, the end's coming soon. We got to do something here. And it came to pass that the servant said unto his master, is it not the loftiness of the vineyard? Right? It, there's too many branches. They're not balanced with those roots. Have not the branches thereof overcome the roots, which are good. And because the branches have overcome the roots thereof, behold, they grew faster than the strength of roots, taking strength unto themselves. It's very similar to this idea of hoarding wealth unto yourself, hoarding women as a resource unto yourself. Behold, I say, is not this the cause that the trees of thy vineyard have become corrupted? So again, all things in balance. And this is the law, really, of the eternities. This is what I understand to be the law. When you look at these ancient myths, for instance, they always have a pre-existence. There's always a council in heaven. There's always 12. There's always that one rebellious member of the council or son you know, who tries to mess everything up. And there's always the son who was called to be the hero and slayed the dragon or slay this monster who is changing these temple ceremonies, right? And there's always a father and a mother. Always. There is never a father and mothers. It is one-to-one. -one. It is always balanced and in harmony throughout the eternities. Now, you may get into some Greek mythology and Roman mythology here where the father figure really messes up or goes and has these affairs, but that is always to represent and symbolize the chaos that comes from that. We, we see that even in the biblical record. I mean, look at Jacob, look at all the chaos and disharmony or the concubinism of, of Abraham and just the awfulness that proceeded from all of that because those are the fruits of that doctrine and that practice. Now, what I think is so interesting here, when I ask the question, why olive trees? I got my answer. <laughs> olive trees are monoecious, which means they have male and female parts on the same tree. They can self-fertilize. Now, some olive trees are known as perfect because they have perfect or complete flowers. So these that means that these trees have both male and female parts on the same flower. And it is one to one. You only have like one stamen and one bud or whatever the terminology is. Sorry, I'm not. And but but if you look at the flowers, and I should have given you a, a representation of that, it is one to one. Incomplete flowers or trees, they have male flowers and female flowers on the same tree, but they're separate. And then, I kid you not, polygamous trees, that's what they're called, have a combination of both perfect flowers and male or female flowers on the same plant, but usually it's more female. So interestingly enough, you have this imbalance of too many women to one or a few men on a polygamous tree, so to speak. <laughs> so is that why this was an olive tree allegory instead of being about grapes or something else? Or olive tree parable, rather, sorry. So speaking of this idea of inequality, right? In, in Jacob 2, 17, he says, think of your brethren like unto yourselves and be familiar with all and free with your substance that they be reap rich like unto you, right? He's talking essentially about the law of consecration here to live in a Zion society. And then in verse 31, for behold, I, the Lord, have seen the sorrow and heard the mourning of the daughters of my people in all the land of Jerusalem and, yea, and in all the lands of my people. Remember, we just learned about these branches going out to the four corners of the earth. And it's saying this is happening in Jerusalem. This is obviously happening in the Americas. It is happening everywhere. And he's hearing the cries of these daughters because of the wickedness and abominations of their husbands. How could this be happening 
when the Lord has nourished them and given it to them so much and, and it's happened again. How does this happen? Well, we're going to explore this, but first we need to read a bit more from Jacob 3. He says, but behold, I, Jacob, would speak unto you that are pure in heart. Look unto God with firmness of mind and pray unto him with exceeding faith. And he will console you in your afflictions. And he will plead your cause and send down justice upon those who seek your destruction. Who is he talking about? Well, in just the verse before, he's talking about the men. The men who are breaking people's hearts, women and, and children's hearts. And that he's saying many hearts died pierced with deep wounds. So he's talking about the men in their society here. How are they seeking their destruction? Okay, going on. Oh, all ye that are pure in heart, lift up your heads. See, who are the pure in heart? They see God. Receive the pleasing word of God and feast upon his love. Right? Because in the end, it's about love. And what is polygamy? What is hoarding of wealth? What is it not about? It's not about love. I'm sorry. And it, it's not. It, it It's about elitism. It's about we are part of a special class who have a special doctrine and only so many of us can do it right whereas as nephi says the lord god doeth nothing in secret it's free he invites all to come unto him with this doctrine you can't the numbers don't work the math doesn't work so you can only have an elite class of the men who hoard more of the women as a resource and so sometimes that has been portrayed as well, only the most righteous then, because only the most righteous are going to do that or going to be blessed with the prosperity to be able to sustain that kind of a lifestyle. And the poorer men, well, they can't. So they're not as blessed. They don't get into that elitist highest stage of covenant making that the other men do, right? Going on, for you may, if your minds are firm forever, but woe, woe, right? Covenant curses unto you that are not pure in heart that are filthy this day before god for except ye repent the land is cursed for your sakes and the lamanites which are not filthy like unto you right because he's saying they love their wives they love their children they're one-on-one -on -one. nevertheless they are cursed with a sore cursing shall scourge you even unto destruction these are covenant curses because like the people after the time of josiah they knew better lehi was led out for this very reason, Jacob says, this is why they were let out in the first place. And now you're going back to this. So why does he say these are people who are seeking to cause their destruction? Was that in their intention? Probably not. But it's what inevitably leads to it because it is a form of murder to get gain. So, for instance, in Jacob 2.35, Behold, ye have done greater iniquities than the Lamanites, our brethren. Ye have broken the hearts of your tender wives and lost the confidence of your children because of your bad examples before them. So this is that verse right before the pure in heart one that I was just reading. And the sobbings of their hearts ascend up to God against you. And because of the strictness of the word of God, which cometh down against you, many hearts died, pierced with deep wounds. Now, I think on one level, you could say, these are the hearts of the men that are that died because they were so hard. And, and when the strictness of the word of God comes down against them, they're pierced with deep wounds. But he is, of course, speaking here about the broken hearts of the women. So he's saying, you're you're killing them. On one level or another, you're you're killing them spiritually. You're, you're killing them emotionally, and you may even be ultimately killing them physically when this destruction comes upon you. And what are the fruits besides death? Sorrow, heartache, all over the world, universally, this creates this, this sorrow for these women. And it doesn't matter if you're justifying it with the scriptures. It's still killing and breaking their hearts. Now, just for an example, this is a theme throughout the Book of Mormon. So in Alma 36, 14, when he was talking about his rebellious days where he was going around preaching whatever he was doing to pull people away from the church, yea, and I had murdered many of his children, or rather, 
led them away unto destruction. Just like we just heard Jacob say, he's equating this with murder, leading people away from God, cutting them off from God with false or vain or foolish doctrines. And then in 39 and 5, he says to his son Coriantin, who's kind of doing something similar, there's sexual sin going on here and also his bad examples leading people away, just like the fathers are doing to their children. Know ye not, my son, that these things are an abomination in the sight of the Lord? Yea, most abominable above all sin, save it be the shedding of innocent blood or denying the Holy Ghost. And he's not saying because you had sex with someone outside of marriage that that's the most abominable. He's saying you are introducing this corruption that is leading people away. And that corruption is sexual in nature, but there's more to it than that. Yea, and whosoever murdereth against the light, see, there it is, and the knowledge of God, right? Even those who call light dark and dark light, it is not easy for him to obtain forgiveness. Yeah, I say to you, my son, it is not easy for him to obtain a forgiveness. He repeats it twice. It's not impossible, but oh, that's a hard sin. I know I've been there. I, I had to basically die and be reborn, right? Seek not after what? Riches, nor the vain things of this world. For behold, you cannot carry them with you. It is one and the same. There is such a selfishness to this doctrine of polygamy and concubinism that goes hand in hand with wealth hoarding again and again and again in the scriptures. And that is because that is one of the fruits of these things. So we're going to get some more into this. There's a book called The Evils of Polygyny, which remember that is where a man has multiple wives. And the reason why they make that distinction is actually she does all this research into it, the evidence of its harm to women, men, and society. And she found that in the rare, rare circumstances where you do have, I think it's polyandry, uh, there's apparently no harm <laughs> to society. But, but universally across the board, there is harm from polygyny. So polygyny, like I mentioned, it causes this imbalance. And because of this imbalance in society, you have all these men with all the wealth. You have all these poor men who don't have the wealth. And because they don't have the wealth, they don't have partners. And this incentivizes men to join secret combinations to obtain wealth and power. And what is ultimately prophesied to be the downfall of their society and our society? Secret combinations. And she, you know, talks about there are examples of this even today in places like Africa where polygamy is, is rampant. You have all these young men or even in the Middle East they don't have potential partners. And so it's really easy to get them to join these gangs and things like that because all they have to do is promise them women. And they join because there aren't enough women, right? <laughs> all the women are being taken by a few men here and there's there's not enough. And yes, it does harm men as well as women and children. It is It is harmful to them. I mean, you've got these societies here these fundamentalists practicing this and these fathers, they have so many children, they, they literally don't even know who all their children are. And that definitely does not, that is not in accordance with the proclamation on the family where parents have responsibility to love for care and rear their children. You just can't in that situation, in, in some situations, I'll say there's, there's, there are too many. And so what you have are, are about 50% of the male population in these societies are just discarded. Literally here in Utah, they're dropped off on the highway, 50% of the young men. Because, sorry, there's not enough women for you. And the older guys here, you know, who are higher up in this elitist class, well, they get first pick. So they drop them off and they're known as the lost boys. And it's very sad. And then what does that do to the society in general, right? It's just, it, it's really, it's just awful. And look, I, I'm just going to take a moment here to say that I'm not saying that there may not be some sort of possible circumstance in a celestial world where the Lord might command a man here and there to step in and help a woman whose situation is precarious because her husband has died and, you know, 
she she needs to be cared for in in a certain way or a certain woman is and I don't even know I don't even know what would lead to it I, and you know anything's possible with the Lord and even Jacob himself brings up the idea of Abraham sacrificing his son there was a certain level of obedience to that but that does not mean that the Lord is going to institutionalize that there's a big difference between a situation where Nephi is commanded to cut off Laban's head and then institutionalizing that and saying, well, anytime somebody has records that we want that are important for us, we're going to chop off their heads. We are justified in killing them because that's what Nephi did. No, that's that's not what that means. That is not an eternal principle. Same thing with Abraham. Well, just to show we're extra righteous, those of us who are going to make extra covenants with God, well, we're going to sacrifice our children. Well, guess what? <laughs> That's exactly what, what's happened ultimately with the Lamanites, actually. But throughout society, look at Abraham as an example. That is exactly what his father was doing. He was a, a priest. They were offering up thanks offerings, and they were sacrificing women and children. Because who are the ones who are ultimately always sacrificed in these scenarios? Who are, who are the ones that did end up dying on the altar when Abraham did it? The daughters of Oneida. The women are the ones who are sacrificed. You know, I've heard people talk about this doctrine. Well, it's a sacrifice of obedience. Well, you know, like Nephi, right? But But who's the one really doing the sacrificing? As Jacob points out, the women and the children. It's not as it's not as much a sacrifice on the men when their natural drive and inclination of the, of the natural man is to have more sex with quite frankly lots of women or whatever like to gratify that sexual lust is kind of inherent to the natural man. So it's not that big of a sacrifice to give into that, is it? But for women who are required to be faithful to one man but then to see him give in to the natural man like that again and again and again and have to live with that it it breaks women's hearts i don't i don't care if people say that well it's scriptural or it's this no it breaks women's hearts it doesn't suddenly stop breaking women's hearts because people interpret scriptures to see it as a commandment it will it always breaks hearts um <clears throat> that's why you have these you know, I don't want to go too much into the modern church. Well, we will just as examples, but that's why we have examples of, of LDS women in the 1800s testifying before Congress about polygamy and saying, well, women have to, you know, detach themselves from their husbands, right? You have to guard your heart. You can't be too in love with your husband if you're in a polygamous or polygynous relationship because it'll break your heart. I mean, they basically testify to that. Okay, and then in another book that was written, um, and I know that she is LDS, this is Valerie Hudson. She was actually recently in the Latter-day Disciples uh, Conference. She was one of the presenters there. I was super excited. She's incredible. She worked with the Bush administration, did groundbreaking work on national security. Her book is called The First Political Order, How Sex Shapes Governance and, and National Security Worldwide. And she shows uh, here that female subordination functions almost as a curse upon nations. <laughs> Go fig, right? A society's choice to subjugate women has significant negative consequences. Worse governance, worse conflict, worse stability, worse economic performance, worse food security, worse health, worse demographic problems, worse environmental protection, and worse social progress. And the same really could be said to pair, if you want to, to pare it down specifically to polygyny. Basically, what... Rose McDermott is saying in the evils of polygamy is that 100% across the board, the fruits of polygyny on society are bad. There, there are not good outcomes overall. Now, that's not to say that there might not be anecdotal evidence of, oh, yeah, this was a good situation or this helped me out. But that's all that is. We have evidence of that in the saints. Right. There is anecdotal evidence of some women here and there saying, oh, yeah, this was helpful in, in this way for me personally. But but it's only anecdotal. Collectively. Polygyny is harmful to society without fail. And if men mistreat their women and children, whether it's through polygyny or through offering them on the altars and sacrifices, guess what's going to happen to those Lamanites eventually? Yeah. 
they're not going to have protection anymore either. And they're going to be scattered and destroyed. As it says in Mormon chapter four, that they were taking even back during the time of, of Mormon, these women and children offering them a, a sacrifices. And he says, there had never been so great wickedness among all the children of Lehi, right? Because polygyny is bad enough. But when you take it to that next level, that's the worst. You're sh literally shedding innocent blood there, like Alma alluded to. And he goes on, interestingly, to say, it is by the wicked that the wicked are punished. And that is very true. And I would say we could see that even in our in our own history in modern times with regard to this doctrine. So I again, I, I don't want to get too much into this because I am trying to keep it to the sermon that Jacob is giving here. But I think there's a reason why he, out of everything he could have included in the short record, he includes this. I think there's a reason why it's brought up in multiple times in the Book of Mormon and soundly condemned every single time in a book that was written for our day. And so for comparison, I want to show that at the beginning of this dispensation, the prophet Joseph Smith declared that the church was never perfectly organized until the women were thus organized, meaning into the Relief Society. This was in 1842. Sister Eliza R. Snow, who much later served as the Second Relief Society General President, reiterated this teaching. She said, although the name may be of modern date, the institution is of ancient origin. We were told by our martyred prophet that the same organization existed in the church anciently. Just like I was talking about before, Jesus elevated women. And here is Eliza R. Snow saying that there was something like this going on in the ancient church. And then it also says that as Joseph Smith organized the women according to the law of heaven, they welcomed his invitation to expand their spiritual natures and their sphere of service. So this is all from Latter-day Saint history. Now, this was 1842. The, the prophet was martyred in 1844. Now, going on in 1845 in Illinois, in the wake of the murders of Joseph and Hiram, Brigham Young halted the operations of the Female Relief Society. Now, keep in mind, this is before polygamy is announced publicly and introduced into the church publicly, okay? Supposedly, it was going on secretly um, in various ways, but it had not been made public yet. So first, the Relief Society is halted. And I I'm going to read to you some of his words here, and I'm not doing this to bash on him, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm doing this in comparison to what was going on when Relief Society was established, what was the attitude when it was disbanded and polygamy was introduced, okay? So Brigham Young says uh, when he halts these operations that he would get up the Relief Society again when he decided to summon them, meaning the women, to his aid. And when Young called for the reestablishment of the Relief Society in the 1850s, although that's questionable because uh, I there are some things that would indicate it wasn't really reestablished until, I believe, the 1870s. Uh, he did so in a very different context than that which had given rise to the Female Relief Society. So these are the very words from <clears throat> our own church um, website uh, or books. One, this one's called The First 50 Years of Relief Society. So it was done in a very different context, it says, than the original Relief Society. Why is that? And why did he disband it? Well, in basically this same sermon or whatever that, where he's he's speaking, and this is from the Discourses to High Priests Quorum, Nauvoo, Sunday, March 9th, 1945, President Brigham Young spoke, something, something, Relief Society, going to meet again. I say, I will curse every man that lets his wife or daughters meet again until I tell them what are relief societies for to relieve us of our best men. He goes on to make some false claims. I don't want the advice or counsel of any woman. They will lead us down to hell. There is no woman on the face of the earth that can save herself. But if she ever comes into the celestial kingdom, right, if she ever comes in the celestial kingdom, she must be led in by some man. God knew what Eve was. 
he was acquainted with women thousands and millions of years before. So this is the mindset of the leader of the church at the time that the Relief Society is disbanded and polygamy is ultimately introduced or polygyny. So is it any wonder then what the fruits of this ultimately end up being? So just real quick, let's just go into some stats here. And uh, these are about as accurate, I guess, as they can be. So not long after, I mean, polygyny is still kind of getting started, but we have some interesting numbers. So in Utah in 1857, with regard to marriages, and yes, these are like members of the church getting married by the prophet and things like that. There were 423 people who were married. Some were married civilly and then later sealed. And the average ages of the men here are 39.5. And the women were about 22.5 years of age. So there's an age difference here of about 17.1 years. Now, 12 of these brides were demonstrably pregnant before they got married. Nine more may have been or may have had preemies. Now, 64 or 15.1% of these marriages were to women 16 years old or younger, or I should say girls, the average being about age 15.2 for girls and age 41.3 for men. So you're seeing this disparity happen here. The girls are getting younger and younger. The men are getting older and older. This time it's a 26-year difference. So the younger the girl, kind of the older the guy. 40 of those girls had babies within the first year. So there was obviously sexual activity going on here. Five of these girls were actually 13 years old when married. Two were 12. And one was 11. Her name was Sarah Jane Barney. And, you know, I don't consider myself to be like, I don't have a weak stomach. Um, you know, I watched my poor husband have just a horrible bone marrow extraction the other day. He's kind of screaming in pain. And while I felt for him, I'm like, hey, let me uh, look. This is interesting. Let me see, you know. But when I read this stuff, it, it breaks my heart. And it makes me want to vomit because I have a 13-year-old girl. And her marrying some 40-year-old man to me is it's awful to think about, really. But Sarah was married to somebody named George W. Wilkins. He was a counselor in the Spanish Fork Ward Bishopric. He married her and 16-year-old Caroline E. Butler on the same day in Brigham Young's office in the Beehive House. Now, I want you to just stop. There's a reason why I'm doing this, okay? Just take a moment and think about these early pioneers, how incredible they were, how faithful, the incredible experiences they had with angels and their fortitude, their love for God. These people gave up everything for their faith. How did they not build Zion? How could something like this happen in that kind of a society? And I want you to imagine your ward right now, okay? Could you imagine any scenario in which people in your ward would justify the marriage of an 11-year-old girl to any man? Now, why? Is that because our society these days is so morally righteous or, or you know, self-righteous or because we're so prudish about sexuality? No. It is because when you institutionalize polygamy, these are its fruits. It leads to people justifying things like this when even in a society that is as sinful as ours, our own natural light of Christ causes us to recoil at the very idea of such things happening. But polygyny inherently leads to the sexual abuse and subjugation of women. Those are the fruits of this doctrine. And it is awful. And if anybody's saying, well, you know, they just lived in a different time. This is some weird urban myth that we have that people got married super young. They may have started courting much younger back then, but they would still wait. So according to this United States census in 1890, um, the average age of marriage for women was 22. 
and for men it was 26, so maybe about a four-year disparity there. And this seems to have held true all the way back at least until the 1700s. And what's more, Branch County, Michigan, also in 1857, and there are other stats from 1857 that are similar, there were 383 marriages that took place there. And the average age of the brides was 22.6, and the grooms was 28. So that's only 5.4 years difference, right? Compared to Utah, which is 17 year age gap. On average, it was way more, right? In other scenarios. And of those 383 marriages, only four of the girls were 16. Um, the age of consent at the time was technically 16. One girl was 15 and one was 14. But only one of those marriages was considered to be pedogamous. If that's a real word, I'm not sure, but essentially kind of like pedophilia, but pedogamous. And uh, it occurred... Um, that year when 15-year-old Minerva Mudgett married 26-year-old Samuel and Paul, July 1st, 1857. Um, so apparently the other one that was 14 married somebody closer in age to her. So that's in comparison, of course, to the 60 pedogamous marriages that took place in Utah. It, just in 1857. Now remember, as the fruits of this grow, and continue on, I have no doubt that things actually became much worse over the decades. And remember that during this time, women were not even allowed to, to meet and that we this wasn't even really officially a, a doctrine yet. Uh, section 132, the one that we that is about polygamy or whatever, wasn't even canonized until 1876 and it wasn't included in the doctrine and covenants and it was included in the pearl of great price in in 1878 so this is like just a long time of this just sort of evolution of this practice and this doctrine so one interesting quote or sad quote really um uh, about the fruits of polygyny uh valerie hudson who was a part of this presentation on um, her book said, Rose McDermott compiles overwhelming evidence that children in polygynous unions fare far worse than children born in monogamous unions, uh, worse nutrition, far worse educational outcomes. One study showed children of polygynous unions were 25 times more likely to die than children of monogamous unions. And there's actually some interesting research from the early Mormon history that shows the same. So I don't think we can say, well, but because it was a church doctrine and because these people were so white, so wonderful, which they were in many ways, that somehow the outcomes were different because they weren't. Because this is the fruit of polygyny. You cannot change it. A bad seed will bear bad fruit. And how does this, how do these seeds even get in there? Right, because it's not God bringing in the wild fruits. Those fruits were those branches, those seeds, those doctrines, those covenants. They were good. So who's bringing this stuff in? Well, I think Jacob answers that as well. At the end, what does he give us the example of? An antichrist who says he was deceived by Satan. All right. So moving on with this parable, verses thirty. Verses 53 and 54 says that basically when you've got good roots, you've got good fruits. And it came to pass that they took from the natural tree, which had become wild, and grafted in under the natural trees, which had also become wild. And verse 56, they also took of the natural trees, which had become wild, and grafted in unto their, and look at the language here, now it switches, their mother tree. Remember, the end soon cometh. And we haven't mentioned Israel once here since the very beginning, but now he's he's bringing in here this idea of the mother specifically. And something else that I learned in my research, uh, this comes from the Mother Tree Project, is that the oldest, most highly connected hub trees or mother trees share their nutrients through a symbiotic network with seedlings, increasing survival, survival of those seedlings, right? In this way, mother trees act as central hubs. Communicating with the young seedlings around them in a single forest, a mother tree can be connected to hundreds of other trees. So it's the mother that sustains life in this vineyard. 
Research shows kin seedlings receive more carbon from mother trees than stranger seedlings do, but the mother tree sends carbon to other seedlings in the neighborhood as well. So everybody ben benefits from this doctrine and it bears good fruit. And again, I don't want to, it's not my place to pass judgment on whatever took place and how it took place. I don't know. All I know are the answers I received personally for me about the patterns that hold true in the eternities. And the pattern in the eternities is one-on-one -on -one as far as exaltation goes, one man, one woman. But in the scriptures, women do represent multiplicity. And in the eternities and in nature, remember all nature testifies of God, right? Isn't it amazing? Women represent this connection, this web, this network or matrix. They represent individuals as one. So a whole lot, but in one body, connected. Men represent individuality. They represent being separated for the purpose of expansion, of agency, of magnifying light so that it can be brought back into the hive or the hub and therefore magnify and glorify God. So men and women play their roles and there's beautiful symbolism there and there's beautiful truths there to be learned. But when that gets misconstrued in a very celestial way, as one man to many women, that's where you have problems. Verse 57, pluck not the wild branches from the tree, save it be those which are most bitter. And we will pluck from the trees those branches which are ripened that must perish, cast them in the fire. And this I do, that perhaps the roots thereof may take strength because of their goodness. What has President Nelson said? If the world loses the moral rectitude of its women, we will never recover. This is the last time, the end draweth nigh, right? Women were basically enslaved, Jacob is saying, by this doctrine. And, and we have it in this day and age. It's, it's sexual slavery, right? And, and if, if it gets taken out of context or if somehow women again buy into a doctrine that is not about true love and that twists and perverts them and their love and their natural tenderness that they have, the world will never recover. And, you know, I do just want to say again, this ultimately is about love and really knowing the love of God. You know, and some people may say, oh, well, it is about love. It is about helping, you know, there's a widow here or whatever. You know, my husband and I, we've helped a lot of single women or widows or divorced women, and he has never required them to marry him in return. <laughs> because with the understanding that you would be having sex, that's essentially that is the definition of extortion and sexual slavery. So uh, going on, and because of the change of the branches that the good may overcome the evil, wherefore go to and call servants that we may labor diligently with our might in the vineyard, that we may prepare the way that I may bring forth again the natural fruit, which natural fruit is good, and the most precious above all other fruit. So remember, this gathering has already taken place. The covenants have been cut once again in the latter days, this end time. They are there, but they're not bearing fruit yet. We still have to have the roots take strength. Wherefore, let us go to and labor with our might this last time, for behold, the end draweth nigh again. And this is for the last time that I shall prune my vineyard. So no pruning has really gone on yet. It's going to happen. And again, I would say maybe there's a difference between pruning out doctrines and cutting off branches and burning them, okay? Something to consider. Verse 63, graft in the branches, begin at the last that they may be first, the first that they may be last, and dig about the trees, both old and young, the first and the last, the last and the first, that all may be nourished once again for the last time, wherefore dig about them and prune them and dung them once more for the last time, for the end draweth nigh. And if it so be that these last grafts shall grow and bring forth the natural fruit, then shall ye prepare the way for them that they may grow. There's another gathering to take place here, even though one has already taken place. 
And as they begin to grow, ye shall clear away the branches which bring forth bitter fruit according to the strength of the good. So again, here is this balance. We're not going to clear away all of the bad branches. Uh, you could say the bad doctrines, whatever it is. It, it You know, you don't pull up the wheat and the tares right away because you could destroy uh, the tender wheat that is still growing, that hasn't had a chance to fully take root, the good seeds that need to still take root. So little by little, according to the strength and size thereof, you shall not clear away the bad thereof all at once, lest the roots thereof should be too strong for the graft, interestingly, and the graft thereof shall perish. We just don't have time to go into everything, but please go back and reread this with prayer and understanding. And I lose the trees in my vineyard. For it grieveth with me that I should lose the trees in my vineyard, wherefore ye shall clear away the bad, according as the good shall grow, that the root and the top may be equal in strength. There it is again, verse 66, until the good shall overcome the bad and the bad be hewn down and cast into the fire, that they cumber not the ground of my vineyard, and thus will I sweep away the bad out of my vineyard. And the branches of the natural tree will I graft in again into the natural tree and the branches of the natural tree will I graft in. So this could even be, a, I would say, a third gathering, or it could just be alluding to that second one. And thus will I bring them together again that they shall bring forth the natural fruit, and they shall be one. And the bad shall be cast away, yea, even out of all the land of my vineyard. For behold, only this once will I prune my vineyard. And it came to pass that the Lord of the vineyard sent his servant. Now, this is interesting, because what have we been learning about this whole time in Isaiah? There is an end time servant, someone who was present, possibly even at the time of Moses, who has been present this whole time doing this work on one side of the veil or the other, right? And that he is going to be integral to the gathering of Israel to their land of inheritance. And the servant went and did as the Lord commanded him and brought other servants. What does servant mean though within this context? And they were few. And the Lord of the vineyard said unto them, go to and labor in the vineyard with your might. For behold, this is the last time that I shall nourish my vineyard. This is the last time that I'm going to nourish it as I have been nourishing it and trying to nourish it before with these doctrines. What is the servant going to do? He's going to be integral also in bringing forth records. New scripture. For the end is nigh at hand, and the season speedily cometh. And if ye labor with your might with me, ye shall have joy in the fruit, which I shall lay up. And like it that was nourished, it, you know, for a time out in the wilderness, right? Which I shall lay up unto myself against the time which will soon come. And it came to pass that the servants did go and labor with their minds. And the Lord of the vineyard labored also with them. So now he's laboring side by side with his servants, the Lord. Jehovah is. And they did obey the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard in all things. This is a level of people on the level of somebody like Nephi, who he says, thou hast sought my will. You weren't even worried about your own life. And so because of this, you, you, you get the sealing power, interestingly enough, right? You have this sealing power to seal things on earth and in heaven, which is also something similar to what's done in the temple sealing the dead who are underneath the ground like those the roots of those tree or up in in heavens if you want to say like that with the body of christ that is here on the earth but it's those who aren't seeking their own will or aren't seeking to be special somehow when jacob refers to this idea of looking beyond the mark he's saying they instead of looking for the love of god which is ultimately what we're commanded to seek at the end of the Book of Mormon as well. It's the love of God that we need to know. Ultimately, people are seeking for some new doctrine, some elite doctrine, you know, where if I can be more obedient than somebody else to this, well, then I will get higher blessings, a higher kind of exaltation in the eternities, right? No, you're missing the mark. The mark is Christ, okay? The mark, the mark is Faith under repentance, baptism, the Holy Ghost. And then like Elder Brendan just said this last conference, and then you repeat that cycle again and again and again. It's pretty simple. And as you do, it's a cycle that actually is a spiral that goes upward to the love of God. Because God is love. 
verse 73. And there began to be natural fruit again in the vineyard, and the natural branches began to grow and thrive exceedingly. And the wild branches began to be plucked off and to be cast away, and they did keep the root and the top thereof equal according to the strength thereof. And thus they labored with all diligence according to the commandments of the Lord of the vineyard, even until the bad had been cast away out of the vineyard. And the Lord had preserved unto himself that the trees had become again the natural fruit. And they became like unto one body, right? One heart, one mind in Zion. And the fruits were equal. There was no hoarding of wealth, no hoarding of wives, no hoarding of doctrines or being special or elite, right? Because the true love of Christ causes you to forget about yourself. And look outward and instead of saying, well, what can I do to get to where I need to be in heaven? It says, what do you need so that you can come to know how much God loves you? Because with that love, you will have the wings to fly to heaven. So how can I help you know that love? That is what we're talking about here. Versus limiting doctrines which turn people into property, which make people extraneous to your kingdom that you establish with your rules, that limits and says, you can't get into heaven without such and such and such. Well, that's not what Christ says. He says, it's free to all who come unto me and hear my voice and follow me. And the Lord of the vineyard had preserved in himself the natural fruit, which was most precious unto him from the beginning. What does he mean? The beginning of what? Well, let's finish it up and then we'll see. And it came to pass that when the Lord of the vineyard saw that his fruit was good and that his vineyard was no more corrupt, he called up his servants and sent unto them. For behold, this last time have we nourished my vineyard and thou beholdest that I have done according to my will and I have preserved the natural fruit that it is good even like as it was in the beginning. Hey, he's repeated this twice. It must be important. And blessed art thou, for because ye have been diligent in laboring with me in my vineyard, and have kept my commandments, and have brought unto me again the natural fruit, that my vineyard is no more corrupted. Now think about this. If we're being nourished in the end times with new records and new doctrines, but it's like as it was in the beginning, what's being restored here? And the bad is cast away. Behold, ye shall have joy with me because of the fruit of my vineyard. For behold, for a long time will I lay up the fruit of my vineyard unto my own self against the season which speedily cometh. And for this last time have I nourished my vineyard and pruned it and dug about it and dunged it. Wherefore I will lay up unto mine own self of the fruit. You know, I, I just want to say dunging is kind of interesting. I wish I had the quotes on hand, but uh, there's some really great quotes about the idea that religion needs to be mulched, <laughs> kind of, to see what new life will grow. And that, I've, I've quoted it before, but that the idea is like, what we have is great. Now let's see what comes from that as we continue to progress on in this ongoing restoration. So um, so I'm going to lay up this fruit for a long time, according to that which I've spoken. And when the time cometh that the evil fruit shall again come into my vineyard, then will I cause the good and the bad to be gathered. The good will I preserve unto myself, and the bad will I cast away into its own place, interestingly, not burned, but cast away into its own place. And then come at the season and the end and my vineyard like cause to be burned with fire. So we are the fruit in this instance and not necessarily the trees because ultimately that's going to be all burned and all that remains is fruit. So what does it mean like in the beginning that the fruit was most precious as in the beginning? Well, we have those very words in Genesis, in the beginning right? In the beginning of creation, in the garden of Eden, there was one tree with a name. That was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. There was another tree with another name. That was the tree of life. And you had one man whose name was Adam and one woman whose name was Eve, the mother of all living. And the fruit in the end, the millennial age, that will be like a garden of Eden again, that fruit will be like it was in the beginning. When Adam hearkened to his wife. So Brigham Young was right. God did know Eve. 
for thousands, even millions of years and knew exactly what she was and what she could do to bring about life, to bring about the plan, to be and help meet for Adam so that he could awake and arise and enter in to this covenant relationship with God ultimately. And I believe Jacob is alluding to this in chapter six, verse five, when he says, cleave unto God as he cleaveth unto you. Because what were Adam and Eve commanded to do? Man was commanded to do, to leave his father and his mother and to cleave unto his wife and unto none else. And so brothers and sisters, I have felt the spirit so strong as I've testified of some of these things to you. And that doesn't mean I got it all right. I am learning as you are, you know, but I know that ultimately what I am teaching here is true. I am overwhelmed by the beauty of this message and the applicability in our day and age. And I know that if we are to become Zion, you cannot have a Zion society where there is an imbalance of male and female, as in polygyny, because it that doctrine inherently creates imbalance, just mathematically. And because of that, it inherently creates contention. And you cannot have that in a Zion society. So awake, arise, O captive daughter of Zion. Loose the bands from around thy neck. Clothe yourself with power, O Zion. Put on your robes of glory. Thus says Jehovah, you were sold without price and you shall be redeemed without money. No more shall the uncircumcised and the defiled enter you. I love you all. And I share this message with you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.